My Aunt Vav does not believe in natural death. She says that every death happens as a result of the earth reclaiming you, be that for good reasons or bad, and also curses or something awful has latched itself onto you, or it takes you. She says it doesn't matter whether or not that you have a good spirit inside of you. It does not matter about your deeds, good or bad. For the earth does not think like a person does. And neither do the things that we instinctually fear. When I was four, I met Vav for the first time that I can actually remember her. My mother and I went to stay with her because our neighbor's kid had gone missing. And my family, being hypervigilant about these kinds of things, took me to Aunt Vav. Aunt Vav lives in the Northern Territory on a large property off Stewart Highway. Her house is a shed with concrete floors and corrugated iron walls and roof. She has no groundwater or attachment to the mains, so she relies on a large rainwater tank for showers and drinking water. Vav has a metric fuckton of guns and stuff, and I'm not entirely sure if it's all legal, but she's a woman living alone with only dogs for company a good amount of the time. So, fair enough. Now, Aunt Vav comes from some really old blood of warlocks and druids from Scotland and Wales. But she thoroughly believes in the spirits and creatures of Australia. As far as I know, her husband died when I was a baby, and Vav keeps his ashes on a shelf in the living room, in an urn with the ashes of the two babies that they had lost. I don't remember much of that visit when I was four, but I do remember that Vav never kept her five large dogs on chains. It caused my mother great distress, for she worried that the pit bull and bull mastiffs would harm us. All my life, Vav has ignored her concerns. She has always said that people who chain up their dogs outside are idiots, for a dog doesn't belong on a chain. She says that they can't protect you on a chain, and sure enough, the dogs never harmed us. Instead, they would often come on walks with us, ever watching and herding us close to the house. Now, I have visited Vav many times over the years, and as I got older, she has given her wisdom to me. I don't partially give a fuck if you believe me or not, but I am just offering these stories to you because I thought it would be good to share them. Basically, there are several things that I have become sure of. The first is that when Vav dies... I will be the one who inherits the house and land. I'm not particularly sure if I will want it when she dies. Secondly, Vav is cursed. She says that her grandparents did awful things that angered the spirits. And it has been passed down to her, as she is the one who has the blood. And apparently, I do as well. When I was nine, I was sleeping on a mattress at Vav's house in her living room because my mom was in a hospital in Darwin due to complications with the pregnancy. I went to sleep after watching some Rugrats on VHS when I was woken up by the dogs. Vav had seven dogs at this point, with three of the original five. The rest were younger. I could hear them barking and snarling like crazy, but it was beyond anything I'd ever heard dogs sound like, and I've heard what dogs are like when they're chasing down a wild boar. I was pretty afraid and got up to go look for Aunt Vav only to find her already sitting at the table by the kitchen door. She was slowly loading a rifle, had the pockets on her belt bulging with ammo, and there was a shotgun and machete on the table across from her. I remember asking her what was wrong with the dogs, and her looking up at me with a smile. I don't know, Blue, but let's go have a squiz. She let me hold the machete in its sheath as we left the house, and led me to the edge of the veranda. The area around us was lit up in all directions from her perimeter lights, which she must have put on whenever she woke up from the noises. She propped her shotgun up against one of the beams. I remember her eyes, sharp and bright, as she scanned the area. She whistled for the dogs and they came running, whining and snarling with a ruff on their backs, raised all the way down their spines. This is private property. You are trespassing. If you understand, respond immediately or I will use force to remove you. Aunt Vav planted one little foot in front of the other as she held up her rifle, and I simply stood there, being about as useful as a bag of shit, my hand finding another anchor on the back of Ripper, who was squirming with his muscles all bunched up under my palm. 
Now, in this area, there are no street lights, at all, in any direction that you can see. So while the stars seem to be endless in the sky, you cannot see a fucking thing. We stand there with nothing but the sounds of the dogs whining. Usually you can hear frogs or insects and ambient noise. But it was like the whole area was holding its breath. Vav? I said, trying not to piss my pants. I didn't understand why she wasn't calling the police when we heard it. There was a thump. Then... Respond. A fucking gurgled mess of the word was hissed at us from somewhere beyond the line of the light, and there were rustles from grasses in the direction that Vav was pointing the rifle. At this point, all the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I pissed myself. Vav hissed at me for a torch, so I gave her one of my big yellow ones that were on the ground by the house, fumbling the machete, but not totally fucking it up. Even as warm urine made my legs itch, and my jeans stick to me. You. She swung the light beam back and forth, but it didn't reach very far at all, and I didn't realize what she was doing. There was a reflection from a pair of fucking eyes out there in the dark. Yellow-green spots that stood a little taller than me. Vav didn't even hesitate. Sick em. And just like that, all seven of the dogs took off into the darkness, their snarls like little battle cries as they went to chase down whatever was out there. I just wanted to go back inside when Vav suddenly tilted her head, listening. There was a quiet thump from somewhere to the left of us, and Vav handed me the torch and told me to shine it out into the dark. I was nearly crying, and when we saw the eyes, Vav started punching out rounds towards it. I dropped the torch and covered my ears against the sound. There were several thumps that sounded like a frightened rabbit, but so much louder and bigger. Vav swore, picked up her shotgun and the torch, and ran off into the dark. She was swallowed into the blue-black night, her torch beam cutting through it. There were more thumps, and that's when I saw it, illuminated for just a moment. It was black, its back arched like a cat, and a big, thick tail. But it was easily half as tall as Vav, with legs built for running on all fours, and a massive head. There were more shots in the dark as the torch beam hit the ground and rolled away from the thing. The thing was screaming, loud, guttural cries. I could hear the dogs hightailing it back to the house at the noise. I was frozen against the wall, and Vav must have picked up the torch, because the beam was shining sporadically back and forth, searching. I saw what you had! Vav was screaming into the dark. I saw what you had! Then, Vav let out the strangest moaning sound like the type that comes when you're on a roller coaster and feel ill, but you can't scream. She shined the light out onto the trees as the dogs came thundering back, barking more. Spud was holding his left front leg off the ground, his pained yelps between his snarls. Then, Blue? Blue, are you still there? And if there is one thing Vav has taught me, it's that if someone calls out to you in a situation like this, you respond. I'm here, Vav. I heard her mumbling out there still shining the light out as the dog circled her. Get inside, get inside, now! I was hit in the eyes by the beam of swinging torchlight as Vav sprinted towards me, and I had turned to get inside when something stepped right parallel to me, off of the veranda. I only saw a long, skinny limb, about the same circumference as my own, take a long stride towards where Vav was. It had to have been a leg, but it was at least half as tall as the roof, and whatever the rest of it was, had to be much taller. I screamed and ran as fast as my legs could carry me to the door, my slippery, sweaty hands managing a grip on the screen door handle, ripping it open. Then came the steel bar door, and I pulled it open as Vav's shoes hit the veranda edge. Once I got inside, Vav barreled in after me, slamming the door and locking it. She was sweating and white as milk. I was crying. Oh, Blue, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, Blue. She was saying, It's okay. The tall ones wouldn't hurt you. You're a kid. They wouldn't hurt you. It was only in the morning that Vav sat me down and told me that the tall thing by the veranda was something that hunts the other things. The things that can speak. She told me that the tall ones come from the trees and they only cause mischief, usually, but they travel after the others because the others take people. They take children. 
Vav spent a long time on the phone that morning and made me stay inside watching my movies. She left for a while but came back and told me that Spud had died. I cried for a long time. Spud was a good dog. That afternoon, a utility vehicle pulled up that had three aboriginal men in the back and two in the front. They dragged a dead kangaroo out of the back and left it on the veranda, and Vav went outside to speak with them. She said that the things had taken one of the aboriginal children and left the kangaroo as a symbol of good faith to pay for Spud, because they believe that Vav is a bush hag, a cursed witch. She told them that the tall ones were searching the property, and they said they had called them after the ones who took the kid. Vav said the kangaroo was payment enough, and they could leave the property peacefully. Vav said that they fear her because she's cursed, that they have to repay whatever they take from her, because everything she owns is property of the dark spirits. That night was the first time Vav had let me see the things out there. I asked her if I could tell people. She told me I could, but that nobody would believe me, except the aboriginals, and then they would be afraid. There are things that I have done now that I know people would never believe. I don't expect anyone to. If you do, great, thank you for listening. If you don't, it's okay. I wouldn't either. But these are the main things that Vav has taught me that I follow. You cover their tracks to protect other people. If you find a body or kill something, you take it to the edge of the property, and the others will claim it. You never try to take them alive. Do not hesitate, and you never try to get payment from them or use them to claim payment in any way. Do not keep souvenirs. They are not people. They have no grasp of human logic or emotions. I will post more stories chronologically of me and Vav if anybody wants to read them. It's about time for some spoopy OC on here anyway. Fuck you and your terror threads. When I was ten, my baby sister was a squalling little thing pink and pudgy. My parents were fighting, so my mom packed us all up and brought us to Aunt Vav's house while my dad was working away. I think my mom was lonely. It seems to be a trait in my family, being lonely. My mom would spend the days laughing and cooing at the baby while systematically ignoring me. Blue, Aunt Vav would say, come help me mend a piece of fence. I wondered why my mom was getting so distant towards me. I think it was because I looked so much like my dad. I have his thick red hair. I have his blue eyes, paler than my mother's. I have always wondered if she truly hates me, or is disgusted by me because I am the reason she married my dad. Whenever I used to worry myself sick about it, with no other kids to play with, Aunt Vav would be there. Blue? She would always begin. Then? Come on, we're going for a swim, or let's go for a drive. Or come help me check the water tank. Come read to me. Let's paint. Let's go looking for quartz. Come with me into town. So, I did those things. And throughout these seemingly ordinary chores, Vav would bestow upon me small tidbits of information regarding things that had become a secondary part of my life for a little under a year. I would half listen to her telling me stories about the aboriginal cryptids, dreamtime stories telling me which parts were true and which parts were false. All the while, my mother became closer and closer to my baby sister, Sandy, and further from me. I think that is why I care so much for Vav. The amount that she raised me while my mother and I grew apart was what caused me to act how I did. Anyway, one of those days, my dad shows up at the house. Vav takes me and the baby out so they can fight or talk it out. The entire time, Vav looks annoyed probably because she can't smoke around the baby, while my parents are yelling awful things at each other. It's pretty hot out, but I decide to go exploring anyway, and I take some of the dogs with me, and Vav stays with Sandy. Usually, I don't go into the bush without Vav, because she's told me not to. Also, snakes and shit. But I was so angry that I ended up going around the back of the house and into the bushes and trees. I ended up picking up a long stick, and beating the shit out of a tree trunk, until I was exhausted enough to finally cry about the situation. That was when I heard the humming, a deep, low hum that was continuous without melody. Now normally, you wouldn't go and check it out, but I was a pretty fucking stupid kid. 
and the more I listened to the humming, the more it felt right to go after it. I followed the source, and it was only a minute or so away when I found it. There was a bloated, rotting kangaroo corpse. The smell was so utterly heavy in the air that I could feel it in my fucking throat, almost suffocating. Maggots were wriggling around in the exposed parts of the skull, falling gracelessly onto the leaves and dirt. Flies were heavy on its fur, and parts of its flesh were discolored and pulled oddly. Things that rot seemed to always be warped and twisted versions of the living. It was then I heard the sound of the grass moving, and I looked up to see something small moving through the grass. I was frightened and I gasped, and it was then that the dogs took off after it. It took me too long to make the command for the dogs to stop, because Herc came struggling back with his kill and orphan Joey. Herc, drop. Herc's tail wagged in a little circle as he sat down. Drop? He dropped the twitching body on the dirt, and I pulled the infant towards me. The little thing was bent oddly at its back. I could feel where its spine had twisted and one of its hind legs kicked out, as though it couldn't help itself. It was making small noises. I tried shushing it, cuddling it into my body, but nothing worked. Eventually, it stopped moving, and I just held it for a little longer. I'm sorry, I said, petting the joey. I'm sorry. I didn't see you. I didn't want to take it back to the house because Mom would get mad. She wouldn't let me touch Sandy with dirty hands saying that it would be all my fault if the baby got sick. So I put it on the ground next to its mother, and when I went to stand up, Herc nudged me excitedly, and I fell. I fell face first into the mother's corpse, surrounded by the thick smell of death. I could hear the maggots eating, feel them squirming against me, and she was so slippery and putrid, I thought I was going to pass out. I couldn't even scream because I didn't want to open my mouth but my hand closed around something inside of the kangaroo. Something solid and hard. And when I pulled myself up so I was kneeling, I kept going. It was a bone that detached itself from the rest, the muscle and sinew slewing off of it as I tugged. I scrambled backwards until my back hit the thin trunk of a tree. I gagged and I couldn't see properly. I scrubbed at my face with my sleeves and once I could, I stood up and staggered out of there determined on getting to the water tank so I could use the hose attached to it on my body. I remember the journey taking forever. I had vomited twice and was dry gagging, trying not to let any of the kangaroo fluids inside of my mouth or eyes. Vav and the baby were on the other side of the house, but Herc was covered in crap too, and he took off towards where she would be. By the time I reached the water tank, I could hear a crunch of boots on some of the dry ground. Blue? What the fuck? Are you okay? Is that blood? My dad came over and dragged me towards the water tank, ripping the hose off of its holder and spinning the handle until water came flooding out. I gasped and clawed at him blindly, one hand still curled around the length of the bone that I had pulled from the kangaroo. My dad was petting me down, wiping the gore off of me with quick, efficient scrubs of his hand as he directed the hose over me. Clothes off, Blue. Come on. We have to get the blood off. Dad pulled off my shirt, getting me to bend at the waist so it came off easier, without pouring the gore water down my body again. Then my pants and underwear and my shoes and socks. Are you hurt? My dad kept asking, and I kept shaking my head no. Oh my god, Bill. Is that blood? Where's Sandy? My mother's voice came from behind my dad, and I felt my stomach drop. Where's Sandy? A sick, bubbly feeling deep in my torso overcame me like a flame. Where's Sandy? I was so utterly angry at my mother in that moment that I raised my hand, pointing the bone outwards. Vav came around the corner, then carrying Sandy. The moment I realized Sandy was what I was pointing at, I felt victorious. My mother raced over to Vav and took the baby from her, my hand wavering as Sandy was hidden from view. My mother took her inside and did not look back at me once. It was then that I looked at Vav's face, and she looked horrified. It lasted for a few moments as my dad made me drop the bone and put my arm down, more water slashing over my head and making me cough. When I saw Vav's face again, she looked furious. I told my dad and Vav about the kangaroo and about the joey, and my dad went to check it out. While he was gone, Vav grabbed me by the arm 
her short nails digging into my skin as she held tight enough to bruise. Do you have any idea what you've done? She said. She pulled me towards the veranda and forced me to sit on one of the lawn chairs while she sat opposite. I felt something like dread settle in me. I shook my head. Blue, why did you point the bone at Sandy? Because I wanted to punish my mother, I thought, but I didn't say. Vav stared at me for a while, with her lips pursed. I shook my head. If you weren't angry at Sandy, why would you do that, Blue? I have told you that we don't curse people here. Why would you- She suddenly leaned over and grabbed my face. You do not punish others to hurt your real target. Do you understand me, Blue? I started crying. Blue, you have done a terrible thing today. Go inside and shower. That night, Vav kept her distance from me. And the next morning, the dead Joey was on the veranda, as though Herc had dropped it off. Vav made me scoop it up into a shoebox and bury it, and my dad left that night to go back to work. For those of you who aren't familiar, bone pointing is a means of wishing death upon those who have wronged you. There are many different ways of preparing the bone, but you have to really mean it. You cannot take back bone pointing but you can try to appease the curse by offering it something else in return. Vav said that an offering of myself wouldn't work because I am a husk, like her. She asked me if I wanted to use my mother, but I said no. She asked me if I wanted to use Herc, but I said no. That night, Vav went out into her truck and didn't come back until it was very late. She found me watching over Sandy while she slept. It's taken care of, she said and then left to her room. Vav didn't speak to me for a couple of days, and then it was as though nothing had ever happened. My dad wanted to move away for work after that, and between all of that and my parents' rocky relationship, I didn't see Vav again until I was 13. I didn't see Vav again until I was 13. The tall ones, as Vav has explained to me, are, I guess, a bit like dryads. Tall as trees, incredibly thin, and often get up to mischief. I have more stories about the tall ones to come. They hunt down the black creatures. At first, I thought they looked like crocodiles for the size of them, but they have longer legs and can move their spine in directions that crocodiles can't. They have much higher flexibility. Also, the thumping was apparently their tails on the ground. They have huge, thick tails. But Vav told me that they're mostly hollow inside. It's how they move the children that they take. They lure you close, then swallow you up, like an angler fish dangling a light. They move in groups of two or more and head back to their territory before they consume the children properly. The tall ones frighten them as they are supposed to be equally strong and do not require rest as often. When I was 13, Vav helped me make my first friends. I used to go to a school called Humpty Doo Primary when I was little. I got pulled out for the move that lasted until I was 13. It was just before my 13th birthday that my parents' relationship ultimately became totally unsalvageable, and my mother began the lengthy process of trying to take both me and Sandy away from my dad. When I was 11, my mother was pregnant again, but there was something wrong, and the baby was stillborn. It turns out that the baby had too much fluid in the brain, and the brain had not been able to properly form almost like a brain slurry. At least, that's how Vav explained it when I asked. Long story short, there was a lot of grieving between my parents. My dad lost custody, and my mom had me and Sandy, and we moved back to Darwin. I just wanted to see my dad, but I felt like I was probably never going to see him again. The court costs that he had to pay, including my mother's, were sizable, not to mention the child support and other payments that my mother had claimed. The last time I saw my dad, he was getting into a car, looking like an empty shell. My mother was flourishing with her new job at a bank, and I was busy trying to keep Sandy stable at this point, when my mother announced that I would be going to stay with Aunt Vav for the school holidays. I think she wanted me gone, and didn't want me home alone to ruin things because Sandy was in daycare. Now, I love my little sister a whole bunch, but she was still a baby, barely a person. She was a sponge, just absorbing the world around her. So I couldn't tell her why I would tack bay leaves in every corner of every room. 
I couldn't tell her why I didn't think Grandma died, because she was just old. So, for the winter holidays, between terms two and three of my first year of high school, I went and hung out with Aunt Vav. When I saw Vav for the first time in nearly three years, she pulled me into a hug. She was pleased to see that I had the knife she sent me for my 12th birthday tucked into my belt. We hung out for a couple of days, and then she piled me into the car. We're gonna hang out with some real country, she told me, pushing my cap down on my head. Now, Aunt Vav's closest neighbors were a big family who had a lot of sheep, a lot of cows, and a lot of land. They lived about 20 minutes away. I remember Vav selling them a couple of her more distant areas, because what the hell was she going to use them for anyway? Vav prefers being further away from people, because she thinks that humans weren't built to live in close quarters, like cities. She says humans make each other crazed. She would go on about ancient nomadic lifestyles, and then territories. She said that being surrounded by so many people is bad for you, because people don't like each other. We headed out. It was getting towards evening. By the time we got there, there was only an hour or so left of daylight. The family has a pretty big house with a big shed, plenty of tractors and shit around. I briefly met the adults before Vav handed me off to the kids. There were ten of us. Three siblings, blonde and all boys. There are two half-caste siblings, a boy and a girl. Then three brunette kids, two older girls and a little boy, and another lone kid who is really tan, probably European or some shit, and me. I'm the only 13-year-old, and our ages range from anywhere between 10 to 18. There were a couple of other kids, but they were all under six, and with the adults. The setup was that the backyard was a large bush area, but with wide paths cut into it, so that the kids who lived there, the blonde boys, could ride their bikes through it. One of the brunette girls was the oldest, and I could tell she was just hanging out with us because she was on babysitting duty. The half-caste boy introduced himself as Rabbit, and I realized it was probably because he was born with a cleft lip and a palate, known as a hair lip, and was missing one of his front teeth. So, I guess it made sense. The scar was a pretty prominent feature of his face, but he spoke pretty well. He was 15. When I was introduced as Blue... A couple of them tittered. Blue the redhead. Australia had a thing for ironic nicknames. The other loner tan kid was named Saul, and he was also 15. We hung outside where the family had a swing set and a large climbing frame. Just talking shit, playing tag, and then we ate dinner, which was just a big barbecue. The adults started drinking, and we kids were left to our own devices. So Mandy, the oldest girl, went inside and got a dolphin torch for us to use to play a game of Spotlight. We played for a while. It was exhilarating, getting to just play random games with other kids. At one point, Saul and I were the only ones sitting on the trampoline, watching the others play, when Rabbit started yelling, Saul, you piece of shit! I said I spotted you! Immediately, Saul called back, What do you mean? I'm over here with Blue. Then Rabbit came tearing out of the bush, like his ass was on fire. Fuck! He was screaming, Dad! Rabbit's dad was a big guy who owned a whole bunch of mango farms, and he was pretty drunk at this point, but he came out of the house anyway. Saul and I jumped off the trampoline, and we could hear one of the blonde boys scream. Vav, Saul's parents, and the dad of the blonde boys came tearing around the house with torches, and Vav stopped by me to check me over. Go wait by the truck, Blue, she said, and ran after the other parents, who were off in the bush. Rabbit's dad took his torch and told the other kids to go inside the house. Mandy appeared carrying her little brother and shouting for her sister. By this point, Rabbit's mom had disappeared into the house, and I'm sure was calling the cops. But if something serious was happening, they are a couple of hours away. I could hear the parents yelling for the other kids, and Rabbit was crying, when Saul's hand had slipped into my own. Your aunt said to wait by the truck, right? I nodded and headed that way, pulling Saul along by the hand, and we both climbed into Vav's car. I knew why. Vav had been teaching me how to shoot over the last couple of days, and while I was far from adept, I knew she kept a pistol in her driver's side door just in case. Saul and I sat there in silence, listening to the adults call out the other kids' names. At one point, there was a yell from one side of the car, a section of the bush track. We both jumped when something knocked on the window and Rabbit was standing there, puffy-eyed and looking in at us. We opened the door, and he climbed in, sniffling. 
They can't find Ben, he said. It was the name of the eldest blonde boy. We waited there for ages, until Vav opened the door and ushered us out. It's fine, she said. We found Ben. Looks like he'd been dragged through a few bushes, and he'll need a couple of stitches. But he's fine. Once Rabbit and Saul were with their parents, Vav ushered me out of the house and into the truck. We drove home in silence. Did Ben say what dragged him? I asked. Vav pursed her lips. It was probably a junkie, she said, but then she looked at me, her face in half shadow from the high beams. But then, what would a junkie be doing all the way out there? She asked. It's a two-hour drive from town, I agreed. Why didn't we wait and talk to the police? Vav laughed. Only get involved with the police if you're being arrested, Blue. Were you the one that found Ben? It was me and Kurt, who was Ben's dad. Was it a junkie? I asked. Vav clucked her tongue. Sure. We both slept on mattresses on the floor that night, though I don't think that Vav actually slept. Towards the end of the holidays, Vav went missing for a couple of days. A friend of hers that she called Animal came up and said he was itching to go on a hunt. He was this huge white guy covered in tattoos and looked like a bikey. Vav said that I'd be staying with the blonde kid's family and that if she wasn't back the next day, to stay with them until they found her body, animal's body, or her truck. She laughed then and blew her cigarette smoke out of her nose. She said she was going to take care of the predators looking around our area. She packed herself, Herc, Ripper, Boof, and Banjo into her truck. Animal had two dogs of his own that went in the tray, and they left after dropping me off. I didn't see Vav for three days. On the fourth day, her truck rumbled up to the house and I'd been playing basketball with Ethan and Daniel, the two youngest boys. Ben stayed inside. I went over to her and noticed that she was holding herself oddly. Banjo and Ripper were gone. One of Animal's dogs was in the back, but no Animal. Shelly and Kurt came out, the boys' parents, and had a conversation with Vav, who accepted two envelopes from them. I said bye to my neighbor and friends, and on the way home, I was itching with questions, but I didn't know where to start. What was the envelope for? I asked. Services rendered. Vav replied, then turned up the radio. Garth Brooks made it impossible to talk anymore. When we got back to her place, Vav hosed blood out from her truck tray. I wanted to ask questions about where Animal was, about what she was hunting, if she was successful. But she had to have been, because she had come back, hadn't she? But Vav is terrifying. Sometimes she looks at people the same way she stares down a kangaroo. It's the most detached, lingering stare. Hungry. It's like she doesn't see a person, but she only sees parts. Vav is a predator through and through. That night, she spent four hours in the bath with a bottle of Jack Daniels. She was shivering when she came out in her pajamas. She stared almost unblinking at the TV until she went to bed. The new dog was named Job. When I was 14, Vav finally decided to let me help. I'd seen some shit, but they don't really deserve their own stories. But I do remember the moment that I had Vav's approval. I was at Vav's, I was 14, and I was there for the Christmas holidays. I was going to be in grade 10 in the new year. Once again, my mother wanted nothing to do with me. Sometimes she could hardly even look at me, and Sandy wasn't much better. I was asleep a couple of days before Christmas, having a nap in front of the living room fan because it was almost too hot to move when the dogs went off. Disclaimer. Hello, time six here. I want to interject real quick. The next section will be mentioning graphic details of gore and violence directed towards animals. If animal cruelty or mentions of graphic violence doesn't sit well for you, then on the screen right now, I have tagged the time that this story ends. Please, feel free to skip ahead. Now continuing. I lurched up when I heard Vav screaming, and then she was in the house, bleeding from the arms, face, and neck. It's the dogs! She screamed. The dogs have gone fucking insane! She was wild-eyed and nearly crying. 
Blue, get my gun. I can't use my fucking hand. I, I think Herc broke my wrist. Get my fucking gun. So, I did. I got her shotgun down and loaded it. The dogs ran around barking and snarling madly. The water has been poisoned, she hissed. It's the only explanation. We drank bottled water and only showered in the stuff from the tank. However, the dogs had to drink it. I went to open the front door when, it must have been Boof, threw himself against it, making maddened sounds. They've gone mad, she was saying. They've gone fucking mad. She tried to take the gun from me, but couldn't get a grip, and hissed in pain as her wrist twisted awkwardly. I'll do it, I heard myself saying it. I'll do it, Vav. She looked at me, her eyes narrowed. Okay. All right. I went over to the window and pulled back the glass slide, then hit the screen on the corner so I could pull it off. The dogs heard the noise and came running, but I had already dropped the mesh muddle screening and pushed a barrel through it. I felt my finger hesitate as Hurt came running, intending to throw himself out the window. And then I pulled. It's like a dream from there. The buckshot exploded and the pellets ripped through Herc's face and chest. He went backwards, a spray of gore raining around. Job bit down on Herc's corpse, shaking head wildly. I fired again. Reload. Fire. Reload. Fire. They never show you that. In the movies that don't have an adult rating. A shotgun with buckshot does a lot of damage close up. It shreds and tears and rips leaving behind a state of carnage so brutal. It's almost pretty. I was in a haze as I walked back to the front door, undid the lock, and stepped out. My slaughter pile still dripping outside the window, bits and pieces flung out onto the yard. But I'd only got four dogs, and in the end, we had another. I found Boof had dragged himself around the side of the house, whining and growling all the same. Boof? I asked, lowering the gun a little. I'd known this dog since he was a puppy. Boof let out a ferocious growl and jerkily moved towards me. The fecal smell in the air is a sign that I'd hit him in the guts before. I fired and watched his body ragdoll away before settling and slumping. I barely remember going back inside and putting the gun on the table for Vav. I remember her patting me on the back as she stared at the dog's remains before she took a step back inside. I vomited all over myself and was a sobbing mess. Vav simply petted me on the shoulder until I was done, then pushed me into the shower. Once I came out, Vav was sitting at the table cleaning her wounds. You hurt? She asked. No. Help me then. I helped her splint her wrist and wrapped it. Then we both stood outside with cans of coke, watching the flies swarm over the bodies. It's too hot to leave them, she said. I'll do it, I said. Vav couldn't, not with her wrist all swollen and fucked up. I picked up the smaller pieces and put them in the trash bags, and then wrapped the rest in tarps and put them in the truck tray as well. It was gross. A couple of times the tarps slipped, and a thick paste of hot blood and torn tissue would slide down my shoulders, chest, and back, and flies kept buzzing around my head, trying for my eyes and mouth for moisture. We dumped the bodies at the edge of the property. Vav said that the dogs didn't belong to us anymore. We didn't have a right to bury them. She asked if I wanted to go back to my mom. I told her no. What did this? I asked. Vav laughed. You should leave the country, she said instead. I ignored her. Vav, what the fuck did that? Stop lying to me. Vav laughed some more. Let's see then, Blue. She made a call to the water company to bring a tanker out to refill our tank. They said they would be there in two days, so we showered and prepared to not shower again until it was refilled. We hosed down the veranda first. Then she ran the shower, the kitchen sink, and the outside taps for hours. All night we sat there and listened to the water drain. It'll be in there she said the next day, her bare toes in the yard that was now more of a swamp. It would have dried fairly quickly, what with the heat and sun. She handed me a couple of towels. 
don't touch whatever is down there with your hands. I put on a backpack with the towels and climbed the ladder to the top. I opened the tank. There was a ladder on the inside going down for cleaning. It was pretty much empty with a little under a foot of water left. I shone a small torch into the water, but I couldn't see anything. So I moved my foot around in the water when I bumped something. I nearly screamed when I felt the slide of the snake under my foot, but it didn't move. I pulled out a towel and reached down. I pulled it up. It was heavy, almost as long as I was tall, and had several bulges in its middle. I wrapped it as much as I could, shrugging off the backpack before putting the snake inside, then putting it on my back again. The water had soaked into the material, licked down my spine, ass, and legs. I kicked around some more, but there was nothing else. Once I was down, I pulled the snake out, and Vav used a stick to poke the snake out until it was flat. She frowned and used part of the towel to hold the snake still, resting her injured hand on it, and made me hold the bottom half between the bulges, keeping it stretched and taut. She ran a knife down the belly, and a snake burst like a teddy bear with a busted seam. The bulges in the intestine made Vav swear, and she hacked at the snake until the smooth onyx stones were revealed, almost egg-shaped. They were quite dark and smooth. I thought they were some sort of river stone. Well, she said, it looks like he was right. Vav looked at me. It's going to take everything. We haven't had another dog since. When I was 15, things started to get more real, as well as a lot more fucked. Vav began to look more strained around the eyes. She was sleeping less, drinking less, and smiling less. The tall men made her laugh, though. They won't hurt us, she said. Those are the least of our worries. But I did worry. I'm going to share this next story with you, because while not overly scary, it gives you an idea of the shit that I've had to deal with while staying with Vav. Yes, the Christmas after the snake and stone incident was god-awful. Right after, Vav made more phone calls and some aboriginal people came over. They left offerings at the gate and didn't approach the house. They are calling good spirits here, she said. But nothing is truly good, Blue. Remember that. I became good friends with some of the kids from that party. Rabbit wasn't allowed to come to my house, but I could hang out if he was with Ethan and Daniel. Saul came over a couple of times, and while my house freaked them out a bit, Saul was a freak anyway, so it was cool. Anyway, so, yeah, 15. Wow. I was doing pretty average at school, just passing, and got contacted by the police because nobody could find my dad. And he wasn't paying child support, whatever. Some of the aboriginals and even the white kids at school started bullying me, calling me the white devil or white serpent. Whatever. Fuckers. Saul thought it was hilarious. Why not give them something to be afraid of, white devil? And in hindsight, Saul is the fucking worst guy. He's still a good friend of mine, but he is the fucking worst. Once more, I found myself below Darwin near Vav's house. At this point, we had geese. Let me tell you something right here, right fucking now. Geese are excellent guard dogs. However, geese will protect your house from everything, including you. So yeah, geese are absolutely the fucking worst. Also, they are generally terrifying, but I haven't been able to stomach the thought of having another dog, and I don't want to ask Vav about it because she'll give me that blank stare that makes me feel like a limpet. I once asked her why she didn't sell the property, and she just told me it was all that was tying her to the earth. But then she threw her cigarette butt at the geese while cackling, so I didn't bother to ask again. Anyway, Vav's toilet, if you haven't already guessed from the first couple of posts... It's a fucking outhouse. So if you have to take a shit at night, you have to grab a torch and hobble across the yard to the little building, which is a distance away that you don't want to be walking at night, especially when you've experienced the sheer fucking horror on the property like I have. A couple of times, it was random shit like a frog that was sitting under the lip grabbed my ass. Now, when we had dogs, it was cool. They would generally wake up at the commotion of me walking through the dark, torch in hand, and just come chill outside the toilet while I took a shit. Safety first, you know? However, geese are never your friend, 
and geese do not give a fuck about you. Why? Because geese are the fucking worst. I was on one of these nights that I woke up with a need to toilet. Badly. Now, I fucking hate this feeling, but nature does call. And I, I have, however, started carrying a machete with me. So juggling my torch and machete, I make it to the outhouse. And I'm sitting there, doing the do. When I hear something's footsteps approaching the place. Let it be known that I was not a happy camper at this fucking point. But first, I'm going to give you a little background on the tall men. They are mischief makers at their most basic. They like to fuck with people by moving shit around and breaking shit and scaring the fuck out of you. To these guys, it's all in good fun. However, all in good fun becomes terrifying fucking bullshit when the guys doing it are taller than your house and pretty much invisible unless you see them. In which case, they are even more terrifying because the closest thing that I can think of to compare them to is that stick insect from Bugs Life. So this fucking asshole... Let's call him Jeff, Jeff the Tall Man, has been lurking around for a while now, and he will continue to do so unless we remove all of the trees or stop the offerings on our land. At this point, I'm about ready to torch the whole fucking place. At this point, I'm about ready to torch the whole fucking place, because I do not have fucking time for Jeffrey, because if I'm scared and trying to take a shit, my anus slams shut like some Indiana Jones tomb trap bullshit. You, listener. Say, fuck you, Jeff, out loud on my behalf. It'll make me feel better about how much I fucking rage for Jeff the Tall Man. So anyway, I'm fairly sure this is Jeff outside, because this is the fifth time he's done this. Jeff, man, please go away. And then there's this soft thump on the roof as Jeff leans his elbow on it or some shit, I don't know. But I was ready to hawk out. And then something hums. And I hear Jeff fucking leap the fuck away. Like Jeff is gone. Jeff is out of here. Now, why would Jeff leave? Because somebody is humming outside. Somebody is out there fucking humming. So I decide to fucking chance this shit. Vav? I wait. The humming stops. Vav? At this point, mission shit is a complete disaster. And I'm wiping while I'm standing and trying to pull up my jeans. Because that was definitely a man's hum, and it frightened away Jeff. At this point, I'm so unhappy I consider remaining inside this shit tin until daylight, but I really didn't want to fucking die inside of this shit tin. So like the fucking genius I am, I open the fucking door, torch in one hand, machete in the other, and this guy steps right past the fucking door. However, some sort of PTSD since I've had to deal with this shit occurs, and I react in the opposite of taking things well. I swing the machete forward, and it fucking passes through this guy. And he stops and just looks at me. Like, for fuck's sakes, the machete went through this guy like he was made of smoke. And my rational brain would later tell me that sometimes spirits of the dead linger at places of unrest, who crave companionship and travel in packs. My exact reaction is to make the noise of a frightened origami kitten and pass out for a solid half a second. So I stumble, because creepy shit you can physically hit is one thing. But I don't do ghosts. I will never fucking do ghosts. After that, the situation just devolved into me not trying to shit out enough bricks to rebuild the pyramids, and turning into the Flash to make it back to the fucking house. Ghosts are fucking terrifying, okay? Because ghosts were once people... Ghosts are not something you can rationalize into it being an animal. Ghosts, from my experience, cannot be killed either. Anyway, I ended up telling Vav. She was pretty pissed about it and told me that yelling tends to make them leave. That's probably the most lighthearted story that I have to tell, really. The little shining light. Some of the others do have funnier, goofier bits, but the next one is actually scary. So keep the thread alive and I'll keep writing, guys. Okay. So this one was also while I was 15. Now those rocks that we found in the snake, well, they went missing shortly after we pulled them out of the reptile. We'd wrap them in Ziploc bags and shove them into a shoebox that we kept in the top kitchen cabinet. So I can't tell you the exact time that they disappeared. And I can't tell you where they are now. Anyway, 
one day Saul and I are waiting for the bus at school to take me back to the house that I share with my mom and Sandy, not Vav's house. Saul turns to me and says that some guy is staring at me. So I look around and I can't see anybody. Where? Dude, where? I looked around and Saul had gone really quiet. What the fuck? He said and grabbed my hand. Saul is a hand holder for reals. Anyway, I shake his hand off because Darwin is not somewhere you really want to be seen holding hands with another guy. Also, fuck Darwin. We get on the bus and Saul points and goes, There, that guy. Oh, it's Animal. I wave. He doesn't wave back. I suddenly felt like there was something really fucking wrong. Who is that guy? Introducing Saul the fucking detective. Sit the fuck down, Saul. What's that? Staring at this guy, we have to sit down. Saul is crammed against a window, and we're both watching as Animal lifts a hand and holds up something. What is that? I lean forward. Oh, this guy is holding a pair of fucking eyes, still attached to the optic nerves at the ends. Okay. Saul makes a high-pitched whine, and Animal grins at me. Fucking biggest shit-eating grin ever. So the entire bus ride, I have to listen to Saul having what sounds like an asthma attack, while patting him on the shoulder consolingly. Well, in reality, all I wanted to do was call Vav and ask her if Animal was dead or just a real fucking creep. Saul gets off a couple of stops after me, and he just stares at me the whole time, and I give him a weak smile and wave as I get off the bus. I have to walk a couple of streets to actually get to my place, so it's usually about a 10 minute walk. However, on this particular day, as soon as the bus turned the corner away from me, I hauled ass. I got to the house in record time of a couple of minutes. I reached into my pocket to get my key and felt something slimy. My brain hit the panic button labeled, oh fuck no. So I end up reaching again and producing this fucking eye. And I'm stood there thinking that this isn't fucking fair. That I don't fucking deserve this. And I just threw this eye as far as I could. I was 900% done with this bullshit. By the time I got inside and cleaned the shit off my keys, changed my pants, and had the phone up to my ear waiting for Vav to answer, I had the most brutal headache. So the last story actually brought back some bad memories. It wasn't that important, and I never saw Animal again. So I'm just going to move on to when I was 18. The small tidbits between me being 15 and 18 aren't much, just more ghostly shit and a couple of other spots of other Australian encrypted bullshit that weren't as full on as they were once I turned 18. But if I'm writing about one, I'll mention in brackets or some shit if I've seen it before, and I'll give some basic details. Basically, I'm skipping that chapter of my life because when I was 17, I got meningitis and had to be hospitalized. Hallucinations, needle and spine, and all of that. It was a whole pile of suck. A couple of months after that fucking awful experience, I was contacted by Social Security and the police because my dad's body was found in a car that had crashed into a tree. He'd been drinking and something happened on the road. I don't know. Combining that with the spooky shit and my bad home life, I ended up having a sort of mental breakdown my last year of high school. I had to drop out because I couldn't handle life and stuff. I ended up moving in with Vav for the long haul because my mother and I had this massive fight and she didn't want to ever see my face again. I got out of my funk just after my 18th birthday and also my second job. My first job was a retail at a corner store. I worked at a privately owned service station or it's a gas station for you Amera friends. So there was no Shell, Caltex, Starmart, Woolworths or whatever putting its brand all over shit. It was located a bit out of town on the highway, and it wasn't in great shape. There was a leak in one of the fridges that spread water constantly, so we had to run a towel over that section every couple of hours. I got to, and from, work in this fucking lemon that Vav let me use, because she had her truck. It was pretty rusty, and sometimes the brakes stuck, but at that point, I didn't really give a fuck. Anyway, about the shop. It was pretty small. We only had three pumps, two unleaded and one diesel. There was this big freezer about the length of a car outside that had a door on it for ice. 
Anyway, this icebox would clank every couple of hours. Quite loudly if you were working night shift, but I was pretty used to it. We had a staff toilet and shower in the back, a public toilet outside that required a key, and a couple of shitty cameras that watched the door, the till, and the pumps. This place was decked out with only the most basic of shit because it was privately owned and a fuck away from everything else. Our boss, this guy named Matt, was actually pretty good. He always made sure that two people work night shift because people are less likely to rob or murder you if you have more than one person in the shop at one time. He also let us watch TV shows or bring in our own movies to watch behind the till on this small ass TV that was on the counter. I worked with two people usually on night shift. This aboriginal woman in her late 20s named Amy and this other guy named Rooster who looked like he fell out of a bad place in Europe or some shit. Amy was tall, skinny, and had ever-frowning brown eyes that could barely be bothered to look up from the magazines that she poured through. She used to paint her nails weird colors in the store, and I'd let her do mine if she was in a social mood. We fell into that awkward, not quite friends, but a little more than co-workers, after I caught her smoking inside and told her she was a fucking idiot. We were at a fucking patrol station for fuck's sakes. Rooster was different. He had this stack of Ren and Stimpy VHS that he would watch every time he came in, or else he would watch The Simpsons. He used to be the one to use a hammer to make the warped ground near the fridge go flat again, and also found it hilarious to play the who is that game with me. You see, when you work night shift at a patrol station where there is no night counter, it means if people want fuel or snacks or what the fuck ever, you have to hit the button that opens the automatic door, because after 10pm, we turn off the auto and open it manually. Now the camera facing the door lets us get an okay look at people, because sometimes you aren't there watching, and you miss them step out of the darkness or their cars, into the shitty exterior lights. So, there is this unspoken rule at Australian gas stations after about 11pm, where if you are approaching one that has a night counter, and you aren't a fucking insane person, You hold out your hands either side of you and just off your body. This way, we can see that you don't currently have a weapon on you and really ups your chance of opening the door. You see, we're trapped inside this box until daylight and if you look dodgy as fuck, we don't open the fucking door. It's the number one rule of being a patrol station clerk working night shift. You don't leave for anything. So if someone is being actively stabbed outside, you call the police. You do not open the door, and you do not leave the store. After you call the police, you call your boss. It's just the way it works. When people show their hands, we decide if they look like they're going to try and steal shit or murder us. And then you hit the switch that opens the door, and then it shuts and locks behind them. So while this person putters around all five aisles of snacks and other bullshit, we watch them and try to figure out their story because night shift is fucking boring. That's the whole point of the who is that game, and it becomes pretty weird because of repeat customers. Every night shift patrol station clerk has a story about at least one repeat customer. For instance, we had one guy come in every Tuesday and Friday between the hours of 11pm and 1am, and he would buy 8 bags of ice, a 4 pack of mini cable ties, and a large iced coffee. Every time. No changes. Each bag of ice is about the size of a 3 or 4 year old and weighs 5 kilos. That is what makes the who is that game so much fun, because you have no fucking idea what these people are doing. Now, at this patrol station we had what I thought was a poltergeist or some shit. Rooster named it Marvin after Hitchhiker's Guide, because he seemed to just be the stroppiest son of a bitch. Now at first, I didn't know the place had Marvin, but I found out about him on my first night. Now, it's normal for shit to fall off shelves in the shop, and it's normal for the outside light to flicker sometimes. We even had this industrial bug zapper outside that hummed lowly, and then crackled as it killed mosquitoes and moths. Anyway, my first night working there, somewhere after 2am, Rooster's episode of Ren and Stippy was cut short. The TV turned off. I turned around from cleaning the window, and Rooster was just sighing and shaking his head. He pulled out this cassette radio that was under the counter, and he was bitching under his breath. Come here, I'll show you how to deal with Marvin. Who the fuck is Marvin? The icebox outside clunked 
and I watched a packet of chips fall off of a shelf. Marvin is a dick, don't worry about it. But you do need to know how to do this, so when you work with Amy, you can. And she will leave the store before she helps out with them. At this point, I was getting pretty pissed because, as you know, I don't do ghosts. What the fuck? There's a ghost in here? Nah, you never actually see Marvin, he just does shit. Rooster explained that at some point or another, during the night, Marvin turns off the TV and starts fussing about, knocking shit off of shelves and tripping you over, exploding bottles of coke and walking around the store. He gets progressively worse the longer you ignore him. I sort of believe, but wait with Rooster, when we hear footsteps on the aisle, that we keep the toiletries. Then several tissue boxes fall off the top shelf, like someone hit them on their way past. The way to stop Marvin is simple. The radio cassette player has a bootleg cassette already inside of it. Matt tried to get rid of it once and brought it back the next day, and Amy won't touch it. But Marvin loves Diana Ross and the Supremes, so you bring it out whenever Marvin decides to act out and you play his tape. Someday We'll Be Together seems to be his favorite song. We've experimented with Marvin a lot since then. If you play the tape earlier in the night, he turns it off. He only wants to listen to it when he's ready. If you ignore him for more than an hour, the power trips out for a couple of seconds. If you fast forward through the song, the leak gets worse and you have to start it again. I now play that song in my car a lot. So, Marvin is okay, I guess. I think he's lonely or sad, but I was never able to do anything about it. I mean, we don't even know his real name, or if it's even a guy. I know it wasn't really a scary story, and in fact it makes me a little sad to share it. Because playing the song every night or morning and trying not to think about why Marvin makes us play it for him is pretty upsetting. I just wanted to give you guys an idea of what working there was like. I worked both night shift and day shift, depending on the roster that changed over, but normally, I would do two weeks of night shift and then two weeks of day shift. If you have any questions about Marvin, feel free to ask away. I don't know that much, but I'll answer what I can. One day, I was working the day shift with Amy. It was almost too hot to fucking move, and the air conditioning in the shop was busted. We had like three fans set up, but all you could smell was patrol and rotting mangoes as somebody had spilled a bunch down the highway. The temperature was approaching 43 degrees Celsius, or nearly 110 Fahrenheit. So these fans were doing fuck all. I could pretty much slick my hair back with my sweat. The fans were doing nothing but pushing the heavy, stank, patrol, mango decay air around. The Northern Territory is so fucking awful. Amy looked like shit that day, I can remember clearly. She'd thrown her hair back in a ponytail, and there were weird strands sticking out. She looked like she hadn't slept in a good long time, and big sweat patches were on her back and underarms. We had to wear these god-awful white polos to work with name badges. And I knew if Amy looked like shit, then I, with my red hair and fair complexion, was a hotter mess than Courtney Love. At around midday, I was mopping up the fridge puddle, trying not to gag at that weird ozone and rot smell you get when stuff melts in fridges and freezers. Amy was prowling behind the till, back and forth like a trapped feral cat. You're going to wear through the flooring, I said as a joke, and Amy just bared her teeth at me. You gonna tell me what to do, white fella? She asked and narrowed her eyes at me. Great, we've devolved into calling me White Fella again. My name is Blue, I said. Amy scoffed and continued pacing a hole in the floor. That ain't your name. You and the bush hag you live with use fake names because the bad spirits took your old ones. I put the mop back in the bucket and wiped my face on the inside of my polo. What? You live with the bush hag, eh? I live with my Aunt Vav, yes. Amy let out a peal of ugly laughter and produced a cigarette. Vicious Vav, that's what my uncle calls her. He and my cousin reckon she eats the goodness out of people. That's why she's stuck on her bloodland. And that was fucking great, because of course this gossip would catch up to me. He calls her Vicious Vav? Amy nodded. Vicious Vav. They say at night she turns into a parentee and attacks people, so she can be a person during the day. Amy, that doesn't even make sense. Parentee are reptiles. They're cold-blooded. They need the sun to be active. I know my shit about lizards and snakes here, and listening to Vav tell me about dream time stories meant I wasn't about to believe the shit spewing from this third generation scum. She pouted at that, 
For those of you who don't know, if you see a wild parentee, it is probably as terrifying as seeing a crocodile, if not more so. They are the biggest monitor lizards Australia gets, and generally are about 2 meters long, either side of 6 foot, and they're fucked. They can stand up on their hind legs and can be as tall, if not taller, than a man. Also, we were closer to Catherine, and not Alice Springs. So it seemed unlikely that we'd see any parenty at this point. Basically, Amy is a dumb bitch. Now, I have about half a foot of height on Amy, and easily 10 kilos. I was made for picking shit up and putting it down. So, if we ever came to blows, I think physically, I could do some damage. However, there's something about living in these parts that teaches you not to be a prey. Something that makes weakness a shameful thing. After all, strength means little against somebody who will do absolutely anything to win. Another thing about the aboriginals here is that they will not fight alone. It's fucking annoying, and I've never had to deal with it. It's probably the best part about being Vicious Vav's nephew. I ended up making her put out the cigarette, again. Tension between Amy and I was high for the rest of the day. I got it. She was terrified of me. Terrified I was going to hurt her somehow. But I needed this job. And I needed to know who the fuck her uncle was, and why he was spreading shit. So we just carried on, tentatively polite to each other, but not being overly friendly. At about 4pm, this woman pulled up in a white station wagon. She fueled her car, and I'd seen her before. Her name was Deb, I was pretty sure, and she was missing her left foot. She had a metal prosthetic that we could see that day, because of her wearing shorts. Her sneakers squeaked on the floor where the water was still drying, and I tried to break the ice between Amy and I, and asked how she thought Deb lost her leg, to start up a game of, who is that? Amy stared at Deb for a moment before she said, It didn't want her to run. Okay, I thought. Never play with Amy again. Deb was a mousy little lady who had surprisingly strong-looking biceps and a slight burn across her nose and cheeks. She paid with rumpled cash and had a blank small smile on her face the whole time. Does she ever say anything when she comes in? I asked. Amy shook her head and popped some of the gum that she started chewing instead of smoking at work. I got home at about 7. Vav was already there making mac and cheese on the stove. I told her about Amy and asked what the fuck she meant. Vav dumped the mac and cheese right in the fucking sink. You want to do this right now? She asked, raising a brow. I looked at the food that still had a chance of being salvageable. No, Vav, it can wait. But she ignored me and went into her bedroom, and when she came back out, she had a whole bunch of papers shoved in between two pieces of wood, tied with string. Here, she said, and sat across from me, lighting up a cigarette. They were illustrations. Of men and women, black and white, young and old, and some were children, all staked to the ground. Long pegs of wood through their torsos, hips, shoulders, palms, and ankles, pinning them to the ground like butterflies on boards. A couple of the images seemed to be instructional, how to pin someone down without them bleeding out right away. I flicked through a couple more, and one of them, a staked man, was on fire. There were more. Corpses being left in some caves, the carrion being eaten by birds and lizards. There were a couple of people firing arrows into other people made this stand. Chains around their necks attached to nearby trees, so they couldn't run. What the fuck is this? I asked. Did this really happen? I looked up, and Vav was staring at the images. But there was no disgust at them. Like, I felt not even any curiosity. She had this look of resignation. That's what we did. Vav went through each document, carefully outlining what was happening. She told me that ever since our family had come to Australia, we had been doing things like this. Up until her grandparents and their siblings. They had been the last. She said that we sacrificed and murdered and tortured people. That our land used to be much bigger, but she had been selling off portions when she could. That the way we claimed it was wrong. She said that we were scientists, pioneers in our field. Aboriginal lore dictates that a person can be transformed over time, when exposed to the right things. She said that we were trying to recreate the things from stories. However, we weren't doing that. We were just feeding what was already there, helping them breed. She told me that the reason we all use nicknames is because our real names are family legacy. And nobody around here wants to associate with someone with that legacy. 
and then she told me I would never be able to escape it. We had friends, many friends, friends that made everything go away. However, we had to go away as well. And then? We used up all of our favors and were forced into exile. Vav tapped one of the only photographs in there. It was her, as a child, smiling as she hugged a dog. But in order to fix this, we have to go back in. She placed one of the first images, the man on fire, in my hands. This is why I need you. We have to work together. I made it halfway out the house when Vav tackled me. You fucking idiot! She hissed. You stupid fucking idiot! I'm not going to kill you, Blue! For fuck's sake! Well, I'm not helping you kill anyone else either! For fuck's sake, will you please calm down? That's not what we're going to do! I stopped struggling. Then why the fuck would you show me that stuff? Vav let go of me and stood up. Her hands held out like she was trying to placate me. Like I was some sort of spooked horse. I wanted to see how you'd react. And you did well. So, how much of that was true? Vav laughed and shrugged. I don't know. My husband drew those. I slumped down, feeling very fucking heavy. Fuck you, Vav. You're a piece of shit. I wheezed. You're a fucking cunt. I hate you. She grinned. Just wanted to make sure you weren't insane, Blue. I was just making sure. After that, every so often, Vav would make jokes. Hey, Blue. If I asked you to kill our neighbors, would you do it? Fuck you. What if I said please? She would laugh wildly and waggle her fingers at me, going back to her crossword puzzles. One night, I was making some spaghetti when there was a creak from outside. The geese hissed from near the kitchen door and hurried away. Hello? I called out. Jeff? I opened the door to see if there were spirits, because I was so ready to blast my speakers at them. After the first couple of times, Vav told me about how the spirits, while craving other people, do not like loud noises. She says she thinks it's why there are less ghosts in highly populated areas. Vav came out of her bedroom, towel drying her hair. Something out there? She asked. I shrugged, moving back to the stove, stirring the sauce. It's real, though, she said, and I jumped. She was leaning against the counter to the left of me. Those things we've been seeing, those are real, Blue. I shrugged. I know, sometimes I don't make sense, but I think something went wrong up here. She gestured to her head. To help me deal with it. Your mom and me didn't have a good childhood out here, and neither did you. But those things, Jeff, the spirits, those are real. Some people like to mystify it and shit, but they're just creatures. They can be hurt. Doesn't mean it isn't terrifying, I said. I used to be afraid a lot too, she said, smiling. Then I got angry because they've ruined my life. Are you going to let me see them so I know I'm not mad? What about Marvin? She asked. Marvin doesn't count. Okay, she said. After dinner, we'll get in the truck, and I'll show you. We drove for about an hour and a half. Vav took a turn off the highway onto a dirt road. And even with the high beams on, it was pretty dark. I sat there quietly, and Vav had turned off the radio so I couldn't hum along. The windows were down so that we could hear, and it was nearing 11 when Vav turned at a big rock on the side of the road. The truck bounced a bit off of road, but it was nothing serious. I was pretty nervous and not really sure where we were going. Eventually, we pulled up and Vav told me to get out. We walked for ages until we came to a rocky climb. Vav hauled me up. We passed a stream and we walked for about 20 minutes more. It felt like I was on a journey to fucking Mordor. Vav stopped when we came to a couple of large rocks that had a strip of blue material between them. Okay, she said. Here we are. I shone my torch around and there were just more rocks. But we were on an elevated spot looking over an expanse of flat earth. Vav slung her backpack off of her back and pulled out some stakes. She threw them out like discs, and they landed about ten meters away. They should come tonight, she said. It's the season for it, but be quiet. They were chittering. They looked... God, they looked like caterpillars. But each was about as round and long as a regular-sized fire hydrant. Their backs were crusted with soil and their faces were strange, beaked, with huge black pupils on either side of their heads. A couple of heads swiveled towards the light, and they shrieked as though in pain. 
Vav started pointing me away. Let's go, let's go, she said. The stakes were gone, so these things had to be carnivorous, when one of them hissed at me like a snake. Its body began to quiver, and it curled up like a spitting cobra, which, in hindsight, should have been enough of a warning. Their beaks clacked, and the chittering got louder. Its underbody revealed, small set of legs twitching with little spade-like claws. And a slit opened up from where the rest of its shaking belly rested on the ground. Vav swore and pulled me, but a shot of what I think was piss hit me on the collarbone and neck. The torch was off of them then. Come on, Vav said. Did it get you? We began to pick our way quickly back to the car, but it was at least a 40-minute walk over loose rocks and changing inclines. Yes, I said, and my skin began to itch, heating up. Yes? Fuck. If you've ever had a migraine, you understand this pain. I could hardly talk. My legs kept slipping and I felt like someone had picked me up and drilled some holes in my skull, and then dropped me down a fucking well. My eyes kept tearing up, and at one point, Vav was pouring water down the side of my head. I felt like the skin where the piss had hit me was gone, that I had to be pissing blood to feel this level of sensitivity, and I kept reaching up to feel it. It'll be fine, she said, but her voice was too loud. Come on, idiot, it's fine, that's hardly a mark. Let it be known that Vav is a piece of shit, second only to Jeff, the tall man. We got back to the car. All I could hear was static and that high-pitched noise that you get stuck in your head. And I had no control over which way my head was lolling. I was bleeding from a couple of places, all places that I'd fallen or tripped or slipped. Vav said later that it was lucky that I was ragdolling around the place, because if I'd not, I might have broken something more. I became more aware of my headache sometime while I was slumped against the window. My blood had left a nice imprint on the glass. We drove for a while, and the next thing I was whimpering and trying to escape from some really fucking bright lights. Hiking, I heard Vav say. Then, clumsy, terrible, hadn't lost consciousness. I was able to refocus enough to realize that Vav, champion of the people, had bothered bringing me to a clinic. While not a full hospital, it would do for now. At first, I thought Vav would take me home right away and try to treat me herself but I think she knows that head injuries are something to be checked out. It turns out at one point that I'd been stumbling, I went down like a bag of shit and cracked my head on a rock. Only, I didn't hit it on any regular bit of my skull. Instead, it was my eye socket. I had an orbital fracture. I had to take a ride in an ambulance to the hospital and have a CT scan to look for blood behind my eye and the severity of the break. As it turns out, I am incredibly lucky when it comes to orbital fractures. I got to shower at the hospital with assistance of a cool male nurse, and within 48 hours, I was home free. The battered spouse clinic is not here, love, said Rooster. But with a shiner like that, I can see why you're having trouble. Fuck off. Back at work a couple of days later, I was rostered on to work night shift with Rooster. I didn't want Matt to have a look at my face, so I kept it to myself. Rooster was watching the episode of Ren and Stippy, where Ren is an unzomniac, while I was happy to not be on a property where every caterpillar, grub, or worm made me cringe. At about 11 p.m., the icebox outside stopped working. I was behind the till, and Rooster was restocking one of the fridges when it happened. The regular clunk happened, followed by a high-pitched whine. Rooster came sliding up to the glass only a few seconds later, and stared at the icebox. Is it off? He asked, staring at it. It was a Tuesday, so Iced Coffee, the weird guy who always bought like eight bags of ice, would probably be coming in soon. And he always complained if the ice wasn't as cold. Dude, it's fucking ice. Rule one of working the night shift there still hasn't changed. Do not leave the store. But I can see Rooster looking at the ice box. It would take like two seconds to just go out and check. Rooster is still considering it when this person, out of fucking nowhere, is standing in front of the doors. Like, I didn't see them come up, neither did Rooster. He jumps, and this guy is just standing there, in a white singlet and a pair of jeans. No shoes. He's doing the hand holdy thing out, and I could still hardly see out one of my fucking eyes. And Rooster waves his hand around like a fucko. Open the door, Rooster says. So I flick the switch, and the doors open smoothly. This guy is all smiles and shit, and he says good day to Rooster, and for a moment, 
I wonder if homo. But this guy has really hairy toes, so no homo. <laughs> That's so stupid, why include that? He disappeared into an aisle, and before the door could close, Rooster slipped through and went over to the icebox, leaving me alone with this fucking guy. I was standing there like a limpet, and then I watch a packet of Samboy chips wobble on the shelf, diagonally across from me, and then it fucking launches itself off the shelf and lands on the ground behind the till. I was on ibuprofen and codeine pills, so I was just staring at this packet of chips, trying not to draw on myself, when the weird guy clears his throat. I ring up his purchases, two strawberry gums, a Coke, and a Kit Kat. A bottle of Coke exploded in the fridge that Rooster was just restocking. Just this? I ask. Weird guy nods. Yes, just these. Thank you. A packet of Fisherman Mints starts ejecting itself from the little mint stand next to me, and I'm getting this guy's change. I can hear another couple of boxes of tissues come off the top shelf, and Marvin is stomping angrily around the store. This guy just looks at where it fell and says, Stop. Quiet as anything. And the weirder part is, Marvin does. The guy raises index and middle finger at me, pointing them like a little shooty gun. Cheers. And cocked his thumb. This guy gave me the super fucking creeps. He'd left really fucking dirty footprints everywhere. And the second I flipped the door switch to let him out, Rooster came back in. The door closed and Marvin cut the power for almost three minutes.